as has already been said, this is baby day. So we honor our babies, we honor our children, and we honor all who work with them and help to mold them and shape them into what God would have for them to be. Now, of course, the danger on a day, on a special day like this, uh, would be that uh, perhaps you might think that nothing that was said uh, pertained to you. Perhaps your children are out of the house, or perhaps you don't have children, or for one reason or another you might think that uh, you get a free pass today. I don't want that to ever be the case. I want something to speak to everyone here today, and I think it will because this day is all about dedication and consecration. First of all, I wonder how many still have children in their home, children in their home, okay? A large percentage of you still. Have, still have children in your home. How many have grandchildren? Nieces? Nephews? Neighborhood children? How many teach children or work with them? There, Maybe you're a bus driver, a, a teacher, a Sunday school teacher. Okay, so that right there pertains to most of us here in the room today. Uh, and if I didn't catch you in any of those categories, uh, think of the, the, your most prized possession your relationships, your possessions, even yourself. And I want you to think in, those, in terms of dedication and consecration today. We are all responsible as individuals and as a church to impact the next generation in a positive way. And we need to be intentional about it. We need to do it on purpose. Things that are not done on purpose often get left undone. Let me assure you that Satan is intentional about it. He wants all of our children. And we need to be even more intentional about shaping and reaching the next generation. Forrest Whitcraft said, a hundred years from now, it will not matter what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or the kind of car I drove. But the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. If you want to touch the future... If you, want, if you want to make an impact, if you want to leave a legacy, then impact the life of a child in a positive way. Now, if you don't feel like you presently have any influence in the life of a child, it would be a good idea for you to seek some out. Seek out some children and intentionally impact them for good. Could be a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a neighbor, a child at church. Pray for them. Pray for their parents. Encourage them. There was a lady uh, that we barely knew that used to send cl newspaper clippings and encouragement uh, to Bo as he was growing up. She would see something in the paper and she would clip it out and send it to us. And I thought, wow, that is the coolest thing to do, is to act intentionally impact the life of a young person. Let them know you care. You know, as a child growing up in this church, I always felt valued. I always felt important. I never felt like a second-class citizen. There were people, older people in the church that would come up to me and encourage me on purpose. I'm glad you're here. Wouldn't be the same without you. You're the church of tomorrow. Do those sorts of things for the next generation. Because you see, Jesus placed a high priority on children. Uh, Brother Dan read the passage where I'm sure the disciples were well-meaning. They wanted to protect uh, Jesus because he was, uh, he was in demand. Everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. So they were going to keep the kids away. Remember? Children to be seen and not heard, right? Not according to Jesus. He said, let them come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. He, said, he went on to say, unless you change and become like a child, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. So there are qualities of children that we want to leave behind as we mature, but there are qualities of children that we want to embrace and uh, maintain through our, throughout our adult life. It's an awesome privilege and a responsibility to be able to influence a child in a positive way. It's our duty as a church to stand beside the parents and guardians in our church and community, and support them in every way we can. And as we dedicate Lawson later on, I'm going to ask you to commit to that. 
as a body of believers. I'm going to ask for a commitment from you to be that support system uh, for Megan and Sean. I marvel that more parents don't take advantage of what the church has to offer. I marvel at that. I shake my head and I wonder why. It's tough raising kids in this day and age. In the culture that we live in and all the negative influences around us, why in the world don't more parents take advantage of what the church has to offer their children? Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7 says, Hear, O Israel. Any time in the Bible when it says hear, you need to do just that. Perk up. Pay attention. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see, it, it starts with us. These commandments that I give you today are to be, be upon your hearts. Then, he goes on to say, impress them on your children. Impress them. It's kind of like children are like soft clay. They're very impressionable. And then if you put an impression into their lives in a good way, and I don't mean to be making a fist, <laughs> that's a bad metaphor there. If you make an impression in their lives in a good way, that impression tends to solidify as they grow older. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. When you're home and when you're not when you're laying down and when you're not. That seems like all the time, doesn't it? Scripture tells us where to be intentional about the way we raise our children, and it starts with us. Love the Lord the, your God with all your heart. These commandments are to be upon our hearts first. Then we're to teach them to our children diligently and daily. And again, like I said, if you don't have Children that you impact on a regular basis, go find some. Volunteer. Seek some out. Much of this teaching happens during day-to-day -day living. Living out our lives in front of them. Have you ever heard that more is caught than taught? Have you ever heard that children would rather see a sermon than hear a sermon? I could, I could relate situation after situation after situation where my mom and dad modeled biblical Christianity before me. And I watched, and I took note, and I tried to replicate those behaviors in my own life. They probably didn't even know it many times. But kids are like sponges. They soak up their environment, and they're impacted by it. More is caught than taught. Just remember, our children are being shaped by someone or something. If we don't impact our children for good, there will be plenty of forces outside these walls that will impact them for evil. We should live the life before them. We should intentionally teach them the scripture. We should take them to church. The ideal situation of, is for mom and dad to attend with their children. One study said that if neither parent attends, only 6% of the children will become faithful church attenders. Six out of a hundred. If only the mom attends, then it raises to 15%. If only the dad attends, it raises to 55%. But if mom and dad attend church regularly with their children, 72% of those children will remain faithful church attenders. So this shows the importance of parents modeling the importance of their faith. What you do speaks so much louder than what you say. If Hollywood is shaping our children, then we're in trouble. If the secular music video industry is shaping their attitudes, opinions, and morals, we're in big trouble. If they are forming their belief system based on social media, heaven help us. If their peers are the major influence in their lives, that's pretty risky. That may or may not be a good thing. That's why God gave children parents. Parents. 
Parents have the responsibility of raising children. Oh, the church and school is here to help. But that responsibility is entrusted to parents. Thank God for those of you who are involved in foster care, adoption, teachers, van drivers, neighbors, those who help to fill in the gaps for parents who might be diligent, or dilatory, I should say, in their responsibilities. We cannot relegate and delegate our responsibility to raise our children. We can't wait until they're grown to begin planting seeds. It's important to plant those seeds early and often. The devil is definitely making his influence felt. You can believe that. So, so should we. As I said, today is baby day. And today, uh, Sean and Megan will be dedicating Lawson in just a few minutes. But there's four real quick points I want to give you before that time. The question is, have you ever given your children back to God? I can read some of your minds right now. You're probably thinking, I'd like to, but I didn't know you'd take them. <laughs> no, I mean ceremonially, symbolically, bringing them before God and saying, this child belongs to you. We call it baby dedication. That's what I'm talking about. Have you done that? And if you don't have children... Have you taken yourself? Have you taken your possessions? Have you ever just literally presented yourself? Romans 12, 1 and 2 instructs us to do that. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the um, King James Version, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable. In light of what God has given and done for us, the only logical response would be to give ourselves back to Him. He gave Himself for us. The only logical thing would be to give ourselves back to Him. And it's a little embarrassing to admit this, but I have come into uh, by myself in the evening, and I've actually crawled up on that altar, and I've laid down as a living sacrifice. God, I'm yours. Use me in any way you see fit. Whatever the question is, the answer is yes. Have you ever come to that point of total commitment? Total consecration? Total surrender? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about God forgiving you of your sins. I'm talking about that point of total surrender. That's a point that every one of us needs to come to in our lives. And we're doing that symbolically as we present a baby to God, saying this baby belongs to you. Now ultimately that baby, of course, will have to make that decision for themselves. But in the time being, we do baby dedications. Have you ever released ownership? Have you ever taken your hands off? Do we have any people that have, don't raise your hands? Do we have any control freaks in here? <laughs> Do we have people that just have to have their hands on everything? If you just take your hands off, it's going to fall apart, right? Nobody's going to do it quite as well. Sometimes we get that way with God. How arrogant is that? To think that we could do a better, God, a better job running our lives than God himself. Release ownership. Sign it over to Him. God is asking every one of us to put our children and everything else, our very selves, on the altar. Now, I was at an a outstanding conference this week in Orlando, Florida. It's called Expo. And they encouraged us during that conference when we pray, take your hands like this, turn them upside down, and let go. The Bible says, cast your cares. Well, don't just cast your cares, cast your dreams, your aspirations, your possessions, your relationships, everything that you have. Turn your hand upside down when you pray and let go. And then they said, turn them right side up and let him fill them with what he desires for your life. I guarantee you, what he puts in is going to be better than what you let go of. I guarantee it. Have you ever come to that point in your life? 
There's three biblical examples real quickly that I'd like to mention. First of all, Hannah. Remember Hannah had, brought, had prayed for years for a son, and when she finally got him, she gave him up. 1 Samuel 1, 27, I prayed for this child, the Lord granted me what I asked, so now I give him back to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. Mary and Joseph, Luke 2, 22, they took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. But the example I want to look at today is found in Genesis 22, it's the example of Abraham offering Isaac. Starting with verse 1, sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. The child of promise. And go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now that wasn't practiced, that wasn't common, that just wasn't done. I don't know about you, but I would have been thinking, God, I must have missed that one. Can you run that one by me again, please? I mean, I've got these hearing aids, and I couldn't have heard what I just thought I heard. Surely not. Not Abraham. He's included in Hebrews chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. If you were to envision a Faith Hall of Fame, and you walk in there, there's a bust of Abraham right there. Because early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. Early the next morning... He took with him two of his servants, his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back. I thought he was supposed to offer Isaac. I guess that's why they call him a man of faith, huh? God promised me this son. He'll bring him back to life. He'll do something. But we, me and Isaac are coming back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac. He himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Ab Yes, my son, Abraham replied, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You see, Isaac was not... Young, he probably could have overpowered Abraham at this point, uh, but he didn't. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. Some, some versions say, God will provide himself a lamb. Let that sink in for a minute. Mo Abraham was speaking prophetically. He was talking about Jesus Christ. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, can you just visualize this situation? It's almost beyond comprehension. He reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. Isaac is as good as dead. For all practical purposes, Abraham has just offered his son as a sacrifice because his intentions were to be obedient to God. But, don't you love that word? Sometimes it's just perfect. The angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, uh, here I am, he replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there in a the thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And he called that place the Lord will provide. Is that not a picture of salvation? Every one of us deserve to die. Because every one of us has sinned, and the wages of sin is death. But God himself provided a lamb, Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, to die instead. To die in our place. That's incredible. So, Abraham literally gave back Isaac. 
Imagine how difficult that must have been. In a sense, we're all called to do that, to offer our children, our spouse, everything we have, ourselves, back to God, to deny ourselves, take up our cross. Giving your child to God is a confirmation of your love for God. Matthew 10, 37, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Putting your kids first is no favor. You're doing your children no favor when you put them first in your life. Not only is it a confirmation of your love for God, but it's also a clarification of ownership when you dedicate your child to God. Psalm 127.3, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's a clarification of ownership and it's a commitment to raise your child God's way. Ephesians 6.4 says we're to bring up our children in the nurture and the admira- admonition of the Lord. It's a commitment to be a godly parent, to teach this child about God, to keep this child in church, to love this child, to pray for this child, to Train this child to make your home a holy place where that child can grow up. Joshua 24 verse 14, the fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served and serve ye the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You guys do what you want, but I'll tell you what we're doing. We're serving the Lord. It's a confirmation, it's a clarification, it's a commitment, and it's also a claiming. It's a claiming of God's promises and blessing. Genesis 22, verse 15, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. We are blessed today because Abraham obeyed. Because Jesus is a descendant of Isaac. All nations of the world will be blessed. So whether you have a child or not, let me encourage each and every one today to make a full and complete dedication, consecration of yourself to God. Offer yourself as a gift back to Him in gratitude for all He has done for us. I'm going to ask uh, Megan and Sean and uh, what's his name to come? <laughs> no, the Lawson, Todd, Steele, and any of the family that are here to would like to share in this glorious moment. We want him front and center so the rest of you can go on either side. What a glorious occasion today as we come together to dedicate Lawson Todd Steele to the Lord. Especially when you consider what Lawson's options might have been. Little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, Megan and Sean and all of the family here, the extended family, uh, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that he may early know and follow the will of God. May live and die a Christian and come unto everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it'll be your duty as parents, guardians, grandparents, anyone, siblings, uh, to teach him early 
the fear of the Lord to watch over his education, that he be not led astray to direct his youthful mind to the Holy Scriptures and his feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies, to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. Now, as I said, I'm going to ask you, the congregation, will you commit as a body of Christ to support and encourage these parents as they endeavor to fill their responsibilities to this child and assist Lawson by nurturing his growth towards spiritual maturity? Will you commit to be a support system? Will you pray? and encourage this family? If so, answer, we will. Yeah. All right. You ready for that? I'm ready for this. I mean, I've been trying to get you to hold him for six weeks. I normally like to wait till their neck gets a little stiffer, but... <laughs> He's pretty good at holding his head. <laughs> Lawson Todd Steele, I dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I agree. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for this joyous occasion and for this precious child. We pray your blessing upon him, his parents, his extended family. May he grow up to love and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Give Lawson a, a hand. All right, you all may be seated. Would you stand with me, please? I would remind you that uh, parents and grandparents of our babies are invited to stay for lunch today. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for life in the body of Christ. So many joys as we come together to celebrate our common life, our koinonia in Christ. And baby dedication is just one of those occasions. We just pray, Lord, uh, for all who are assembled today. Uh, perhaps there are those with no children or those with grown children or whatever the case might be. But we realize dedication is a topic for all of us. It's a point that we all need to come to. Dedication and consecration. And we trust, Lord, that, uh, that if there are those here today that have not done that, that you would draw them to that point in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I feel like maybe the Lord is speaking to some today concerning uh, what we've been talking about. So please let me encourage you to seek someone out, myself or someone that you trust uh, today. Uh, and if you need to make a step, another step in your spiritual journey, uh, we would encourage you to do that. Seek someone out. We'd love to talk to you and pray with you about that. All right. You are dismissed.